Good morning, church. Uh, yeah, I don't know about you. I was, I, I thought of it in my sermon last week, but, but then uh, Grant really brought it out for me today. Of, you know, when we say we need people, need people to see and experience God's love, or to know like where is God, and I said it's through us, and it is through that. That just a personal testimony of that of how you live, but then what you share of the the ups and downs of life. Because sometimes I don't know why. Sometimes people get this idea of like, man, you must be a Christian and you're perfect and life is perfect and there's no hardships and right anymore. Just, if your God is good and perfect and you're like, no, He is good and perfect, and this is how He gets me through the storm and the hardships and the craziness of of life. And and even if I even if I don't always understand how he answers me. He's still with me. And life, even through the hard times, if I don't get what I think I need or I want, I mean, it's still better with God than if I was far from God. And that's a hard thing to explain. That's a hard thing uh, if you're not with God and you see that. 
Um, but I just really appreciate Grant sharing. And it made me think of this passage. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of studying in the book of Romans because uh, Park Creek coming up. And uh, this verse is, whenever I come across it, it stands out to me a lot. Um, Romans chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 18 and lead up to um, the verse later on. <clears throat> where Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is now hope that is seen is not hope. For we hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And I mean that's what brings us together, this this idea that's so hard to explain to, to people of the suffering is not even comparable to the glory that God lays out for us. He gives us gift of eternity. It's like, okay, great, get me there. Give me the blessings and give me the things now. It's like, no, you don't understand. It's, it's just better. Just wait for it. Now, here's a verse that, that gets me, though, is we trust in this. We trust we have hope in Christ. And like, but then there are times, like what Grant shared, they're like, I just don't know what's going on. I don't know which way is up or down. And like, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for, for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose." Like God gave us this time to come together and remember his son and his sacrifice. The disciples didn't want him to leave. He's like, no, no, I'm going to send you a helper. It's like, because life is not easy, and I'm still with you. And that is just a beautiful thing that we come and remember the sacrifice of Christ, but also remember how he continues to love and support us, even when we, just, we, can't, we can't get the words out. He's like, oh, that's okay. I'll give you a translator. No problem. You know, you're having such a hard time. I'll give you this translator, and I'll, I'll know what you need. I just meditate on that, just how God is faithful and good to hear us, even when we don't know what to say. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. God, you give us eternity. You give us hope for eternity, but then you give us everything for each day, and even when we don't know what to say. We just thank you for your blood that covers us and this church that binds us. We pray that you bless this time as we sit with you and commune with one another and commune with you. In your son's name, amen.
that. Um, don't forget, we also have our Amazon wish list. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you can talk to uh, Alyssa. We have one for the nursery and one for camp. But just thank you, church, and your prayers and your support, whether it's through work, whether it's through prayer, whether it's through finances, all the ways that you support. And then to all the people that are going up to have fun, uh, we thank you for everybody that volunteered as well. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Dana. Miss Dana is going to give us a quick missions update um, about how the year has been going and some of the plans that she has for this this year. And if you hadn't noticed, uh, we have a guest speaker today. So after Miss Dana, we'll turn it over to Bob. So Miss Dana. Um, <clears throat> well, this is one of the quarterly reports <clears throat> um, on the missions that we support, both foreign and domestic. And, um, you know, some of the most poignant words that Jesus ever spoke were about children. He said to let the children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Interestingly, three of the five missions that we support are directly in line with these words of Jesus. The first one is lighting the Ethiopian path that Dereje and Mindy Alimi um, head up. And what it is is <clears throat> a juvenile prison ministry serving the youth across East Africa in Ethiopia, Uganda, and, um, and now recently, more recently, a Kenya. <clears throat> Excuse me. Their purpose is basically to transition youth into servant leaders through sports, as well as through caring attention to the physical, spiritual, and emotional needs of the children. Um, here's a little video, I think it can come up, a little video, and if you look closely, you may recognize some faces. The youth prison ministry is healthy and thriving. I just, I spoke to Dereje recently, and he reports, in fact, that one man said uh, that it was, one young person said that it was the best place he'd ever been in, a prison. <laughs> but they're learning from the Bible, and they really like it. In fact, Dereje told me that some steal the Bibles and take them when they're released. And he says, that's okay with him. They're welcome to have them. <laughs> Uh, and, and just a note that Easter was a great big success as someone donated special food, desserts, games, candy, gifts, visits, things like that that really made a, just a remarkable day for everybody. Dereje is going to come, by the way, um, in October and give a first-hand report. <clears throat> but one general note is that Dereje's next trip 
will be next year as he's fundraising this year for needs in the Uganda and Kenya prison ministries. He encourages one or more of us to go and see where our money is going and how it's being used and to talk to the various uh, staff people in each place. Dereje's wife, Mindy, is working at Pepperdine University and she's also completing a doctorate degree. They're boys that we've, we've met before, but Zion is 14 and Adam is 16 and they're both doing well and in fact, um, Adam will graduate this year. And now we have our own Zion in this, com this uh, community. <laughs> it's a great name. The second mission uh, effort that we support is Sparrow which is a pregnancy counseling center over in Woodland. And um, <clears throat> it's also doing their part to fulfill Jesus' words by promoting the sanctity of all human life, born and unborn, as they provide a broad range of life-affirming services which empower mothers to choose life. Our own Carol Duty, who I'm sorry she's not here this morning, but our own Carol Duty heads up this amazing mission. I encourage you to go online and check out all their services. Uh, and there's even help for men. And um, one great blessing that she, she told me to, to mention is that the growth of the medical care that they're able to offer. And, um, and they're able to offer that in the center itself. And now there's a, even a motorized a mobile unit that goes around. So isn't that wonderful? <laughs> um, the third mission or effort that we support is Agape Villages. Agape targets the health and welfare of abused, abandoned, and neglected children in Northern California. In October of last year, Agape reached 65 years of service to these kids. <clears throat> you know, everyone wishes that there wasn't really a need um, for foster services. We wish there wasn't a need, but there is. And Agape is very grateful to the many donors, foster parents, staff, and volunteers over the years who have supported this vital work. It's really vital. And one fabulous accomplishment, though, last year was that 10 children found forever homes. <clears throat> Isn't that great? And that happened through Agape's ability to process adoption when a child is not able um, to return to their own family. You know, that's so wonderful, but at the same time, then Agape loses a foster family that could take in more children, you know. And so, um, right now, that's the greatest need, is for people to step up and become foster, pa foster families. Please consider contacting Agape about being foster parents. The fourth mission that we support, the fourth out of five, is uh, New Hope for Pakistan. And now it's called, actually, New Hope for the World. But Brittany and Sam Gill are involved in a plethora of ministries in Pakistan. Um, they'll be here in August to bring lots of news of what's happening for the kingdom of God in that part of the world. And the list is long if you look at their website. But I'll let them tell you all about that, okay? The fifth mission that we support is a teaching ministry. And the church has set aside, the leaders have set aside an amount for me to go to um, Romania and or Albania and so um, we use those World English Institute uh, materials. And it's basically teaching the Bible truths of the gospel, but using the English language as a draw for those who want to improve their English skills. So I'll be leaving for Romania in one week and two days, and I'll be gone for six weeks. Um, the songs this morning were really wonderful. And I'll probably tear up a little bit, but... It's fortunate that God works in and through our weaknesses. You know, otherwise, I might not have the courage to keep going. <laughs> but I know that our holy and sovereign God is able to enable his people to fulfill his calling on their lives. Our part is to depend on him so we can serve in love and help others be shaped by his grace into the holy image of Jesus Christ. So. I think we as a church community here at Tyler Street can feel good about supporting all these significant efforts to bring people and children not only to safe places, but to faith and obedience in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen.
Thank you, Dana. Thank you very, very, very much. Well, good morning. It's good to be back. It's good to see each one of you, and it's really good to see new faces, to see faces that we don't know. That's, that's good news. But I think the first thing that we're going to do is... Um, oh, there you go. That's the first thing we're going to do is dismiss those kids. Go ahead. It is good to see everyone. Mike, it's good to see you this morning. You snuck in, you know, and it's like, yeah, you, Mike. Yeah, that's one right there. Um, I, I noticed that a few things have changed. Like, you really didn't get a chance to, to greet one another this morning. Um, so we're going to do a hybrid of that. Um, I noticed also that what you guys are talking about is people needing people. And that's just across the board, folks. Um, we're going to be talking about habits of the heart this morning, and one of the biggest habits that we have is when you come in those doors, you know where you're going to sit, okay? and you know, you don't even have to think about it, and what the person up here notices is that there are some, just some big gaps between people, and there are even people sitting by themselves. That's not good. So... You take, you see that it's 5 to 11 right now, right? It's 5 to 11. I'm under some great restraints here. You've got one minute to uh, change. Change where you're sitting and find somebody that's alone or a couple. But go somewhere where you haven't been before. Sit by someone you haven't sat before. And who knows what that's going to uh, lead to. So ready, set, go. You've got one minute. Come on. There you go. Yeah, see, there you go. See, it wasn't that difficult. Hi, Sherry. All right, time's about up. Time's about up. I, I, I appreciate your willingness to, you know, to break the mold a little bit. And now, you know, when everything's over, hopefully you'll be able to visit with some of these folks later. Um, I want to start with a short video. And, and I recognize that, that, that our time is, is limited, so I'll, make, I'll say this also. If you've got to get up and leave, or if you've got to do something, please feel free, okay? Um, we're, we're, you know, we don't lock the doors once everybody's in here. You, you just come and go. But uh, this is a really, really good video that's going to teach us something that we should have known but don't. Okay? Please. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy. But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill, and I was really proud of it. Everything changed, though, when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses, and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle, and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When he turned the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When he turns to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Sandwich. First attempt riding the bicycle. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. 
The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in the brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and twisting the handlebars, gyroscopic perception in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. You can change any one part with that teeny tiny amount of force. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences, and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride his bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody's going to enjoy it. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. <laughs> so here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway, and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks. But after eight months, this happened. One day, I couldn't ride the bike, and the next day, I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily leave that neural path and jump back onto the old road it's more familiar with. Any small distraction at all, like a cell phone ringing in my pocket, would instantly throw my brain back to the control algorithm that I wreck, but at least I could drive it. My son is the closest person to me genetically, and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. That's over half his life. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet with a real astronaut. Are you going to give up? No. Nope. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up. You got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. All right, today's bike vlog. I can ride smooth, I can ride fast. I'm thinking the experiment is over. Okay, now I'm in Amsterdam, a city that has more bicycles than people. The question is, can I ride a normal bike now? I mean, I've spent all this time unlearning how to ride a bike. If I go back and try to ride a normal one, will my brain mess up? So I've tweeted a smarter everyday meetup, if you will, and I'm going to see if somebody brings a bicycle and I'm going to try to ride a normal bike. <laughs> it's backwards, it's backwards. This is one of the most frustrating moments of my life. I had ridden a normal bike since I was six, but in this moment, I couldn't do it anymore. I had set out to prove that I could free my brain from a cognitive bias. But at this point, I'm pretty sure that all I proved is that I could only redesignate that box. So what you're not seeing is just a group of people here looking at me, looking at the strange American that can't ride a bike because they think I'm dumb. But I'm actually two levels deep into this because I've learned and unlearned. All right. After 20 minutes of making a fool out of myself, suddenly my brain clicked back into the old algorithm. I can't explain it, but it happened in a very specific moment. Okay, I, I think you're getting the point. We'll, we'll let him go. Um, now, that is a really fun video, but I cannot 
tell you how important that video is. Because what's the point? What's the point of the video? Uh, is it just that learning new things are hard? That's not the point. That's not the real point of that video and the lesson that it holds for us. Um, so let me put it in another context that is exactly the same principle that he's dealing with. Have you ever heard like a really good sermon or a really good lesson? I mean like a really good one. And, and you thought to yourself, man, yeah, that's, that's what I need. That's what I want. That's what I'm going for. That's where I'm heading. And yet it didn't last that long. That purpose, that desire, that intention, maybe a day, maybe a couple days, maybe even a week. But pretty soon, it was just back to our old ways of doing things. Have you ever experienced that? You ever experienced that? And I'm just talking about, you know, church setting, learning lessons, saying, yeah, I want that, I need that, I'm going to do that. And so we ask ourselves, what's going on? Because the very thing that God's word is supposed to do, supposed to shape us and mold us and change us, isn't happening many times. It's not happening. And we see this same principle in a lot of areas of our lives, folks. We've just never connected the dots. I mean, we see the same principle in eating habits, right? Right? Oh, I'm not going, or I'm going to stop, or I'm going to, and it just doesn't happen. We see the same thing in our exercise habits. Oh, I'm going to start. We see the same thing in our money matters. Oh, I'm going to stop or start using, spending, doing different stuff with our money. And then there are a number of prejudices that we have that we want to change, want to modify, and it just doesn't happen very much. So now let me ask you this. Do you think that Jesus had to think about being kind, being compassionate, being generous, being good, do you think he had to think about it? No, he didn't have to think about it at all. You know, and we just have so many examples in the life of Jesus when, when it says, Jesus saw this person. Or Jesus says, do you see this person? What Jesus saw was different than what everyone else saw. What Jesus responded to and how he responded was he didn't have to think about it because it was his second nature. In other words, his heart and his mind were in alignment. What he knew, he practiced. What he felt, he did. And all of that was under the direction of his Father in heaven. Um, so let me suggest, let me suggest that just as riding a bike is second nature after you've learned trying to ride it, after you've learned riding a bicycle, and once that becomes second nature, you don't think about it. You get on the bike and you ride it. The difficulty that this guy had and you had, you could not ride this bike. You might think you can. You cannot ride this bike because your mind you have a second nature of how to process all this stuff. How to keep your balance, how to move it forward, how to stop, how to go, how to lean, how to... It's just second nature. To relearn that, to ride the bike backwards, is really, really hard. How long did it take him to do that? Eight months. Five minutes every day, eight months. See. I don't want to call the guy a liar, but it's just hard to believe, isn't it? That it would take eight months to learn a simple thing like that. But that's how long it took. I want to suggest that we have a second nature of our character. We have a second nature, just like we know how to jump on a bike and ride it. We have a second nature on how we live 
our life. How we respond to life. How we respond to others. Maybe you've noticed that it's not always like Jesus calls us to. I mean, let me illustrate it this way. Have you ever said, I know I shouldn't, but then you go ahead. Has that ever happened to any of you? I mean, like, regularly. <laughs> right? And I mean, you, you know, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to think about it and at some point say, what's wrong with me? Now, over the years, you've been taught that, well, you don't know enough of the Word of God. You know, and if you just read the Bible more, and if you just go to church more, you know, at least Easter and Christmas, things will get better. Have you noticed that's not true? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed, you know, that after these fine men teaching you, encouraging you, and challenging you, and giving you good stuff from the Word of God, that... Uh, it doesn't always translate into a different life. And that's because, I think I jumped ahead once. That's because we have habits of the heart. And there is ingrained in us as how to ride a bike. And there is difficult to change in us as it is to learn how to ride the backwards bicycle. It's that difficult. Many times, the decisions we make in our life and our actions are a result of not what we know and even not what we want sometimes, but a result of something else. And that something else is the second nature that we've developed in and around our heart or just the central part of our whole being. And I want you to think about that for a minute. Think about how many times you've done not a result of what you know is right and not a result of what you want to do, but you just did it. And you know, you Bible nerds, you're thinking of Romans 7 where Paul says, I don't do the things I want to do and I do do the things. You see, it, it, so see, we're not talking about pop psychology here. We're talking about something that controls a lot of how we think and act, and it puzzles us. The point is that Jesus is right again, where Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this is what sets up that second nature in us. And let me just give you another translation of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying is whatever is important to you, whatever is important to you, whatever is valuable to you, whatever is worth your time and your money and your talents, that's where your heart will be. And, and this is the important part, the implication of that. Because where your heart is, that's what's going to be guiding most of our thoughts and most of our actions. And it's what we're going to live towards. And it's what we're going to live for. See, So this isn't the, the statement isn't the end of everything. It's setting us up to make a conclusion. Why do you, why do you live towards something? Why do you live for something? Well, because that's where your heart is. Because that's what's important to us. You see, what we've done is that we've developed through life's experiences and through observations of life and then reinforced teachings, we've developed a second nature that forms and guides our character. So we shouldn't be surprised when God talks about renewing our heart, you know, renewing it, a new heart. We shouldn't be surprised because eventually that's what's going to guide most of our decisions. 
And so when our character needs changed, like when we're trying to ride a spiritual backwards bike, or, or when we've come to know Jesus and, and we're called to a different lifestyle, sometimes that change can be very, very, very difficult. But the good news is, I want you to know there's good news. The, the good news is that by the help of the Holy Spirit, we can learn to ride a spiritual backwards bike. And yes, it might take, metaphorically, eight months to do such a simple, simple task as that. Now here's a side note. This is a side note for the young people. And this is a side note for parents. Okay, how long did it take man to learn? Eight months. Tell me, how long? How long did it take his six-year-old son to learn? Two weeks. Two weeks. Papa, eight months. Son, two weeks. Now, there's a lesson for another time, parents and young people. Don't think that you're going to sow wild oats and then once you get older, you know you're going to be a good Christian person. Because by that time, the habits of your heart have already been formed. And you'll choose things over Jesus. And you'll choose other things over other people. You know, but that's for another time. Um, so it's why we're told repeatedly, you know, the adult, eight months, the child, two weeks. It's why we're told repeatedly, how did they, did that go back? People need people. Okay, that's why we're told repeatedly and specifically, you have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You have need of endurance. And maybe instead of learning how to ride a backwards bike, maybe you just, just take five minutes a day for eight months to change the habits of our heart. And it's why after this, this is important. It's why after this, after the 10th chapter of Hebrews, we get the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And the Hebrew writer gives us a list of people that have persevered by faith and endured. It's a list of people. Read the list again. It's a list of people with highs and lows, failures and successes, some that were rejected, some that were welcomed. It's a list of people whose heart and second nature were so changed that when God asked them to do something, even if it was difficult slash impossible, they did it. See, We're not talking about super human people. We're just talking about people that five minutes a day they learned how to drive and ride this backwards bicycle. And how did they do it? Well, you know, the simple Sunday school answer would be, oh, they did it by faith in God. But what is it about their faith in God that brought them to the point of, of doing the impossible? You know, like spending 120 years building a boat. Or, or, you know, or like conceiving a child at 100 years old, ladies. Yeah, you think that's funny, Pam. Well, I talked to Sarah. Or, or, or how about offering your only son as a sacrifice? Or, or, or how about taking 300 men to fight an immense army of your enemy? See, these men and women, the first thing that had to change was their heart about trusting God. They just had to learn to trust him. And then they would ride and fall. They would ride and fall. They would ride and fall. Oh, they stayed up a little bit longer. And see, specifically with some of these folks, we can see their hearts being changed. We can see that nature being changed. We see it with Abraham. I mean, honestly, what a loser. You know, threw his wife under the bus, not once, but twice. Shame on you, Abraham. 
But when the time came to offer his only son, the son of promise, he had learned to ride the backward, the backward bicycle. Or, or what about Moses? What about Gideon? What about these folks that their initial response to God was just what yours and mine would be? Yeah, I'm not that man. I'm not that woman. I can't do that. Uh, you need my brother. You need my sister. You need my minister. No. God says, I need you. And I don't need your ability. I need your availability. See? That's what I need, your availability. Um, well, that was the introduction. And uh, so we probably better hurry. Okay? Probably better hurry. Um, so here's what I want us to focus on. Uh, not just that people need people, but that, but here's what the Hebrew writer goes on to say. We're not those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the perseverance of the soul. We're not those. That's what the writer says. This is who we are. We are not those that shrink back. We're not those that get tired of trying to learn how to ride this backwards bicycle. That's not who, who we are at all. Um, we're not the ones that shrink back. And the Hebrew writer includes himself and the dear ones he's writing to uh, as, he's, as he's going into this great, great company of faithful people in chapter 11. But here's what we have to at least understand. What does it mean to not shrink back? And this is the important part. What is, it, what is this backwards bicycle that we're trying to learn to ride? What does it mean? And, well, simply, but of course not easily, it, it means fully accepting who we are in Christ and what we're called to. I mean, here, here's the backward bicycle. Um, in Jesus' words, it would be, it's counting the cost of being a disciple. Look, folks, we can't live our old lives with our old second natures and call ourselves a disciple of Jesus. It means counting the cost. It means putting our hands to the plow and not looking back. It means picking up our cross and following him daily. It just means a different way of doing life. Now, the, the, the way the Apostle Paul would say it, he'd say it, very much the same, but differently, he'd say, it's dying to self daily. See? I I've got my old bike in the garage. I know how to ride it really well. But I'm not going to get back on that old bike. I I'm not going to. I know where that bike takes me. See? That bike takes me to trusting me. That bike takes me to, I'm the final authority, and I do what I want to do. So Paul would say it's dying to self daily. It's living by the Spirit. It's being crucified with Christ. It's all that and more. But it's all that and more in specifically. It's husbands learning how to love your wives. You know, in an understanding way, Peter would add. It's wives learning how to respect your husbands. You know, not that not that he's some goofus dork that you could do better than him. You know, I mean, that might be true. But you're still going to learn. I mean, you know, it, this, that's part of the, this backward bicycle. It's wives learn how to respect their husbands. It's children learning how to obey and respect your parents. It's employers learning how to be fair and just and generous. It's employees learning how to work as unto the Lord. And you can go on. It is every aspect of our life. People. It's how we treat one another. But briefly and quickly, I want to make a point here. That the writer says, we are not those who shrink back. We is not I. Okay? We is not I. We is a people. A special people. A unique people. A collective people. We are the body of Christ. We collectively do things. Together. Collectively. 
We act different. We speak different. We, not just leaders or some group of super Christians, but we, we are a different people. The world will know that we are his disciples by how we love one another. And if the love that we show to one another is pretty much confined to Sunday morning here, I don't know. But I don't know how many people of the world are here to see how you're treating one another during Sunday service. I, I, I don't know. You remember, and I know you remember, we brought it up to you over the years. You remember when Peter kind of withdrew from the Gentile brothers? Remember that? And Paul was there. And you remember that Paul confronted him publicly? And you remember what Paul told Peter in front of everybody? He said, we don't act that way. It's not how we act. And we don't care how other people act. And we don't care what other people's are. But we don't act that way. Because we are a group of people that God has purchased and, and made different. So, uh, here's what we're getting at. That second nature way of living, that way of having our hearts renewed and restored towards God, is best nurtured among we. That's where it's best nurtured. This is a greenhouse to learn how to ride a backwards bike. And, and here's why. Because habits of the heart are best caught instead of taught. Now, you might think that's poor theology. It's not poor theology. It's solid theology. You can read a number of times where Jesus says, now you go do likewise. Or where Paul says, you imitate me like I imitate Jesus. Habits of the heart are best caught instead of taught. We can teach you until we're blue in the face about it. But until there's an environment and a place for you to, to live that out, it'll only be in your head, only. So quickly, whew, quickly, let me suggest some ways for it to be caught instead of taught. This is nothing new. Hospitality. Hospitality is going to be one of the greatest ways to reorient your heart towards God and to others. Invite people into your home. Invite people into your life, your real life, not your Sunday morning life. And, I, and that's not a criticism. It's just that people don't know you if all they see is Sunday morning you. Let him into your real life. And, okay, I won't be preaching here. I'm just going to say a few things here. Stop making excuses. Stop making excuses. You know, like, um, uh, I'm too busy. I'm too tired. My house is too messy. I don't have anything to serve. I like my me time. I'm an introvert. I go to be at bed early. Um, we probably forgot a few that we've used. Stop making excuses. I'm single. Stop making excuses. Hospitality is going to be one of the best environments for your habits of the heart to be changed. You'll be interacting with people who are where you want to be. And there'll be people that want to be where you are. And so that ironing, sharpening iron is going to, is going to stand a better chance of happening. I mean, not once but twice. Practice hospitality in the Bible. Not once but twice. Don't neglect hospitality. And, you know, the, the word hospitality is interesting. It's a Greek word. It's made up of two words. And the, the word is, in Greek, it's loving of strangers. Now, if your neighbor, the Good Samaritan story, if your neighbor is anyone in need, then a stranger is anyone you don't know. So, 
God says, don't neglect it and practice it, which is kind of a funny way to, for me you know, to say practice hospitality. Practice. Hospitality is something we do, but it's something that we practice. It's something that we practice. And so, um, secondly, serving, um, reorienting our heart will come faster and easier when you, we learn to serve and practice serving. And so the, the idea is to start living for something bigger than ourselves. And again, stop excuses. I mean, nobody believes them anyway. Or the people you're telling them to have the same problem, right? I'm too busy. Uh, or, you know, I'm too lazy, you know. But serve. Remember, if you're going to move forward in the kingdom of heaven, it will be through serving. It, that's where it's going to be, you know. It's not going to be in being served. It's going to be in serving. And so, you know, I mean, it might mean restructuring your time. It might mean giving up some of the things you want to do. But find a place to serve in the church or in the community. But find a place to serve. Say, I don't know where. Well, talk to me later. I'll give you a couple suggestions. I got like eight or ten written down here. Um, 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 living, oops, <laughs> that was that's supposed to be wrong. Community, living for something bigger should be in serving. But community, and we're, we're not going to say anymore. You've already heard plenty about community. But lastly, there, oops, see, lastly. See, this is what happens when you make last-minute changes <laughs> to your lesson. Okay, but lastly, a willingness to have our hearts changed. And really, it has to be first. You know, like, that includes blind spots. That's why David would say, you know, search me, God, and know me. And see if there's any harmful way in me. And I'm just going to tell you, there's a lot of harmful ways in me. Uh, not always intentional. But see, I have to be willing. And, and then, you know, David acknowledges in Psalms 51, create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, a good heart, a heart that's after yours, so my second nature is doing what you would do. You can learn to ride the backwards bike of the kingdom of God. You can learn to live as a son and daughter of the king. Uh, we can have our hearts renewed to reflect naturally by second nature the character of Jesus, but it'll take a while. It's just going to take a while. Eight months for the adult, two weeks for the kids. So young people, pay attention. You know, that's why David could say, I'm wiser than my elders. I started younger, started younger. Uh, last thing, and, and if, if somebody has to go to pick up kids or something, I, I understand. But I promise, last thing in just not more than, than two minutes. You remember the letter that Jesus wrote to the church at Ephesus? in the book of Revelation. You remember that letter, right? And he really complimented them. He said, man, you guys are doing good. Your theology is really, really good. I'm so proud of you. You're doing good. Yada, 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 yada. But I have just one thing against you. Just one thing. All the good things they're doing, right? Revelation chapter 2, you read. He says, this is what I got against you. You forgot your first love. Jesus said, you, you forgot about loving me. Okay. You forgot about that thing that will change your heart. Now, here's what I want to leave with. So if you're in that congregation of, of, at Ephesus, if you're in that church, and, and the minister is reading this letter to you, and you're so happy and proud at first, and then he gets to this part where he says, I have this one thing against you, you didn't love me. I, I just want you to think for a second about the different responses that there would have been to that letter. Because here's what I know. I know some people, when they heard that, some Christians, when they heard that, they would have been angry. And they would have thought, probably not say they thought, well, if he thinks he can do a better job, let him come down here and do it. Right? I mean, we're, we're running as fast as we can. We're dancing as hard as we can. If he wants to do it better, let him come down here. You know, of all the nerves. To criticize when we're doing so good. So some, I'm sure there were some people. I, I'm sure there were some people that were just plain confused. Some people were thinking, "I thought we were doing pretty good, man." I mean, I, I, I thought we were on, on a good roll here. No, I really, I really, really did. 
But there would be some people that when they heard that, they got the message. And they repented. And they just, they just turned their heart. And they said, Jesus, I am, you're right. There are things that are more important to me in my Christian life than loving you. What the Hebrew writer encourages us is be those that want a change of heart, that want to be conformed to the image of Jesus, and don't shrink back. All right. Thank you guys so much. Let's stand and we'll close with a word of prayer, and I'll turn it back over to Michael. Okay. Again, thank you for your patience. Let's pray together. Our Father, we bow before you. And we just acknowledge and confess that it is easier to ride this bike that we've learned to ride that didn't have you as our destination. And we're we're trying to learn to ride this backward bike of the kingdom. Confess that it's difficult. Confess that at times we've given up. We confess, Father, that at times we, we don't even want the change that you call us to. Father, I ask you to forgive us. Forgive us and create in us a clean heart, a new heart, a renewed heart. And give us that ability to endure through this process of change, to not give up, to not shrink back. Give us that opportunity, Father, to be added to that list of men and women in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. that that are a witness to us that it can be done. We can learn to trust you. We can learn to depend on you. We can learn how to do what's right. Father, I thank you for these dear ones here. I pray that you'd bless each one. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, church. Thanks, Bob, for coming to visit us. Uh, We're going to get together for our growth groups in about five minutes. Uh, Talk to Stuart about junior week. Talk to Ian about senior week at camp. But other than that, guys, have a great day.